one thing that no one's using is Tomo music. Why don't I just throw a few of those in? But what was really cool is that after the show, one of my favorite teams who was there was Juan Rashix. So right. Like, dude, half our team is Tomo, but like, we don't even use Tomo music. Whatever you did was awesome. You should continue doing it. At my peak, I've worked with a third of the country. There's some people who actually think I don't mix enough Tomo music, and I actually agree with that. Where does the name Dr. Streamix come from? I was originally DJ Streamix up until 2012. But my roommate was like, oh, you're, you're getting a doctorate. You should go by Dr. Streamix. And then I was like, that's dumb. And then the next day, I was like, you know what? Let's do it. Whatever. <laughs> so then just <laughs> Welcome to the RMM show. And with us today, we have the one and only Dr. Shremix joining yeah. us. Thanks so much for having me, man. Absolutely. This is a special episode, especially for me, and I feel like most of our listeners, because you were the first true Thummel creator, DJ, and in some sense, musician that we had on this side of the pond. Right. And in America and not in Toronto. And I think that is super, super awesome. And so excited to have you on the first season of the RM Bubba show here. Thanks so much. Really appreciate it. Yeah, absolutely. So before we get started, I wanted to actually share something with you that I don't know if I had ever told you, but I had actually met you in 2019 when you were DJing an AIF event in SF. Do you remember this? Or, yeah, yeah, I don't know if you remember meeting me, but do you remember the event? I do, yeah. It was, a, it was a gala, and I remember I was like on like a second floor balcony, and everyone's wearing white and all that. Yeah, I remember this. Hmm? Yeah, that's awesome. Because that was the first time I would say I really found out about you, and that's primarily because I went to a small private school and wasn't part of the dance circuit, so I had heard your mixes, but I didn't know who you were. Until I came to this gala, saw you, heard about your music, saw your Instagram and stuff, and you played a few Thummel songs. I remember during that gala, which I was like, okay, would have never expected this. For sure, man. Yeah. I'm glad we had a chance to meet. I mean, I really try to portray myself. I'm just a normal dude. I, I think I had the opportunity yeah. to really dive into Thummel music because of the dance circuit and now I've kind of continued on the momentum. So yeah, it'd be great to talk a little bit more about that for sure. Yeah, absolutely. So we'll jump into that at a later point, but what I wanted to start with is mm -hmm. your origin story, your background and what got you into DJing. So when I read online, what I found out was that you traveled most of your childhood, but you consider yourself, you grew up in Wyoming. Is that correct? Yeah, so I was born in Los Angeles and very quickly moved to San Diego. And my dad was working in the Navy there as a scientist. And so from there, both due to like military interests and as well as trying to escalate in career and go on to like professorship jobs, my dad wanted to move around a bit. And so I ended up in Wyoming where I was there for six and a half years. And my parents later went on to move many other times. But then I went on to the East Coast from there. But I think even though when I was in San Diego and Wyoming, I didn't really have much of a background in music or dance. And I think I just mostly okay. was listening to, you know, film music in the car and that kind of thing. And had an opportunity to kind of explore more of that in college. Yeah, makes sense. So out of curiosity, what was the film music? What was your favorite that uh, you yeah. listened to on your car trips? Yeah, I'd say it's a mix between anything 90s, thousands, Thummel music, okay. Air Rahman, okay. of course, like Hayash Shiraj, Deva, uh, right. you know, the, the right. classics. And then, of course, there's also right. a lot of the 1950s and 60s uh, older Thummel music as well as Hindi. Mm. You know, the mm. old melodies never fade. Never fade, right, right. And I, and I love that about your mixes because in many cases, you're bringing in a lot of the old beats and the old music into yeah. the newer versions, right? Yeah, for sure. Yeah, I, I think I'd like to give homage to like those really older tracks. Uh, I think some of the best Tumble songs actually were from that era in the 50s to the 70s. Right. And I think we just don't hear them anymore. So it's like a cool way for me to kind of channel it back. So, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And it, it creates a sense of nostalgia. That's definitely what many of us listened to growing up. And I think the mm -hmm. interesting thing is it it sounds different, though, now listening to that music 
because when we like grew up listening to it, at least in my case, it was cassette tapes that my dad had. Yeah. And I feel yeah. like listening on cassette sounds very different than listening the new, honestly, digitally remastered versions of like even Ilerajah songs, right? Yeah, yeah, definitely sound different. Honestly, they might sound a little bit better on cassette, but it's hard <laughs> to find those these days. So. Yeah, yeah, that's true. That's true. Maybe there's a way to recreate that, but yeah. awesome. So you grew up in Wyoming, San Diego, and you came to the East Coast, right, for college. Mm-hmm. And from everything I've read in the few interviews that you've given the past, that's where you got your start in DJ. So what was that? Walk us through that journey. Yeah, sure. So, uh, you know, I think I was always very deeply interested in music and I never had a chance to formally learn anything vocally, tabla, none of that. Of course, I did like what everyone does in high school with like band. I think I played like clarinet or saxophone or something, but like honestly it doesn't count. And I've been playing baseball my whole life. And then when I went to college, I decided I was going to do something different. And there was a guy who met me at like a, one of those freshman extracurricular affairs and was like, yo, you should try dance. Nice. And I was like, never really considered that, but I'll give it a shot. Right. So then I tried out and then failed because I'm not a good dancer. Okay. So then just kind of hung around campus for like a bit and, you know, explored different communities and kind of picked up things here and there, just hanging around being a freshman and then try out again and then happen to make it. So now, um, so I went to Brown, which doesn't really have a strong dance team back then. Mm-hmm. And so my captain was like, listen, like we need a way to stand out because we have all these heavy hitters from like Berkeley and like right. Rutgers and Drexel coming through. Like we, we need a way to sound a little bit cooler. Um, and our dance may not be necessarily like, we're not gonna be bringing an audience. Um, can you mm-hmm. like dig deep into like your deep knowledge of music? Because you seem to know more music than most people here and like come up nice. with some dance mix that's like unique. So yeah, sure. I mean, the one thing that no one's using is Tamil music. Why don't I just throw a few of those in, throw in some, you know, kind of off axis Punjabi songs and stuff. And I don't know, I thought we did okay, but I think the way was really cool. And some of my friends who are still in New York could attest to this is that after the show, one of my favorite teams who was there was Wanted Ashiks. They are from mm-hmm. a combination of Queens at different boroughs in New York. They come up to me and it just so turns out that many of them are Tamil. Many of them are like from Sri Lanka, Tamil. And right. Like, dude, half our team is Tamil, but like, we don't even use Tamil music. Whatever you did was awesome. You should continue doing it. And I'm like, you know, like, that's awesome. I was like, I was like oh, damn. Like, okay, I guess so. So then from there, I started helping like, other teams who also were kind of inspired by the, the song choices, honestly. It's not so much like the, the DJ technical skill because I didn't really have that then. But they were like, mm-hmm. you seem to have a mind for good song choice. And so then I started working with one more team and then like five more teams. And then every other year it was like 10 a year. And this year, you know, by this point I'm basically retired, but at my peak, I've probably worked with maybe a third of the country. And I would definitely say that a lot of the circuit was a little bit, not a little bit, pretty biased against using Tapankuti music and using Tollywood and using all of that just Mm -hmm. because they were unfamiliar. And it's a lot of like biases that carry down from our parents' generation. But I think just by kind of like being really persistent and being like, hey guys, like give it a shot. You probably like it. Honestly, half your team is probably Tamil, Telugu, Malayali or Kannada. Yeah, and slowly across years, across probably a decade now, it's like a staple. Like almost every dance routine I see has some element of uh, a kutu routine in it. And, you know, this of course differs pretty strongly from what, ha- what happened in Toronto. And that's I think, a completely different historic answer. But I think in America, mm-hmm. the inception of like, South Indian music of any language is relatively recent. And I think kind of proud to have played some role in that. Because to that point, as I was doing research into different Tamil mixes, I mean, of course, mixes that you had, but also just in general, Tamil like songs being used in mixes, the oldest sources I could find were actually your music in your mixes there. Yeah, I'd say some of the oldest persisting ones are mine. I'm, I'm not going to completely explain credits if I was the first one, because I know that there were some you know, like people have been getting married in America for a while. And I think there's some right. DJs out there who have tried to make some simple Tamil mixes that have carried over from the UK and Canadian scene, but none of them were uploaded in any way that like persisted in a way that people could really, really like search and find. And I think it's maybe because there was a lack of some robust community, like the dance circuit who could like continue to circulate it. And this is like mm-hmm. the early days of the internet, right? Like even YouTube didn't really exist back when right. those early mixes were made. It's just kind of finishing up the story, I guess. 
from there, after I graduated, I was no longer competing in dance and making mixes for dance teams is such a niche thing that people yeah. were like, can you make mixes just to listen to in the car? Could you also DJ some parties? Right. And, you know, I didn't know how to DJ live. So I yeah. got in touch with some friends in Philadelphia who had some, you know, leftover equipment, basically bought it, used, and then just kind of messed around for a couple of years. And then slowly across many years, just taught myself, learned from some of the stronger DJs who are in Philly and now kind of do this pretty routinely. Nice. That's awesome. So you didn't start off DJing, right? It was making mixes. Now you're a DJ. You've DJed several parties, including our Thummel party last year. Mm -hmm. So where do you see yourself mm -hmm. now? Are you now a DJ? I know you still make mixes from time to time or where is your music career or life at this point? Yeah, I think the, the core will always be music production, remixes, and that kind of thing. Live performances are always so it's a way for people to enjoy not only my work, but also just, you know, enjoy the weekend, whether it's weddings or whether it's Tumble Meetup or something, right? But I think at its core, I've always been a huge music enthusiast of many different languages, and I've always wanted to really contribute back to, like, the Tumble scene in some way. I think I'm always going to be most focused on creating new music and creating new tracks. And when the live opportunities present, then like I'll always be there to kind of, you know, have fun and make sure that everyone else does too. So. Absolutely. I think my favorite live experience with you, that was of course not double meetup because that was an epic experience, which we'll get into, but the electric Daisy set that you had where you started off with the song, Rajini song, I was just, I was there like uh, primarily to see you, right? And just like hearing that was incredible there. Yeah. Yeah, I think it's a unique opportunity and I appreciate um, UMSOL for putting that event together. But usually when you walk into a party, you pretty much have like a broad trend in mind. You're like, I will start with Bollywood and then I will slowly traverse towards hip hop across four hours. But when you're right. given like 45 minutes and it's more of a concert style or like a, you know, a planned set, it's, it's cool. You really get to like think deep and be like, like, what do I really want to like intro myself as? And like, what do I, what mixes do I really want to like show people to be like, Hey, like you probably never thought of it this way. And so for what Hari's referring to here is that electric Desi Rave, I pulled out a, an electric remix of Urban Urban from Muttu. And we had this whole like projected LED nonsense going on and like a Reggie dialogue at the beginning and like everything. And it was like 2 a.m. And I was like, I don't care if anybody doesn't get this. It's like, who cares? Like, this is awesome. Let's just do it. <laughs> so it's like, you know, it's I mean, fun. it went hard. It went so hard. And the best part of that was it was not just Tamil. You didn't just start with Rajini. You went across, what was it, eight different languages? Yeah. Yeah, for sure. I think, you know, I was pretty... Pro Tumble for the first few years when I was DJing. And then I started to realize that um, a lot of people were rallying behind the kind of growing South Indian music movement in uh, the American dance scene solely because there were no representatives. Um, they were pretty much right. like, yo, man, like no one really uses Malayalam music. No one really uses kind of the music. Um, and I was like, dude, like, honestly, it'd be great to just find out like who those representatives are who are trying to learn how to mix those languages and really like push it forward. And mm -hmm. sometimes it just takes a spark. And I was just like, you know, what if I just covered as many languages as possible in this set? I don't need it to be the favorite set of the night. It just yeah. needs to be like, I have an opportunity to play this in a venue that is like so high powered in terms of audio quality that right. it, it's hopefully inspiring to somebody. And then they become the next person who like takes their language forward. So, yeah, yeah, that's, that's amazing. Yeah. Right. So on that note, since you talked through that, I think one logical next topic to discuss would be this awesome Instagram por story you posted post the July Tamil meetup, which is the one like around that meetup was the time that we met. We got to know each other. You were in New York for a month and it just timing lined up that we could host a Tamil meetup where yeah. you were joining us as a DJ. So let's, I mean, of course, there's one, I know you know what I'm talking about. There's that one specific bullet, which talks about what you just talked about. But why don't we talk about that story as a whole and then go into a few of the Tamil community and music entertainment topics there. Yeah, but sure. why don't we start with that? What's your, what sparked that? What was your take? What's your feeling from that? Yeah. I think there's a couple elements here, which is that I would say for a concert that goes from 11 to 3 a.m. or 10 to 3 a.m. as it was, I think it's a pretty 
cool and prime spot to be last to go from two to three. Mm -hmm. But I also recognize that it's also at a point of time where a lot of people are probably tired and a lot of people are probably heading right. home. And so I want to like reward people for staying through that. Right. And in addition, mm -hmm. I kind of want to give a little bit of an explanation of like, you know, at this point, you've probably been partying for like many hours. It's just like, all right, I mean, I have a full awareness of like why exactly he's doing this whole concept. And so just like a nice summary at the end to be like, hey, guys, like, you know, if it's called electric Daisy rave and not electric Hindi rave, like I, Daisy means everything. Right. So I was yeah. like, why don't I just take you through all the languages and show you that it doesn't need to be just like 2010 Bollywood that has to be remixed into an EDM format for you to feel that it's mm -hmm. party worthy. Right. And like India, as well as all of its other countries uh, surrounding it deserve to like kind of celebrate its diversity and we should all, you know, we're all basically American in some form or fashion. And so putting that into words, I think sparked a couple of interesting responses. I think there were some people who said, damn, I wish I stayed. It would have been really cool to see that. And there's other people who said, I have never heard of a person doing a DJ set like mm -hmm. that on purpose, like intentionally, as opposed to just doing it kind of ad hoc across four hours. And I think it really was like, Okay, like it seems more like Sri took a bit of a it was not like political. It's like he almost took like a stance with in the form of art and they were like, Okay, like mad respect for doing that. And like you took your opportunity and or you saw your opportunity and took it. So it's good. And a lot of the people have been reaching out afterwards because I put most of those tracks on SoundCloud, being like, Hey, nice. like I'm using one of the tracks you used for like a wedding because my, my groom is kind of to go i was like okay this is awesome right like i mean maybe it just sweet like, yeah demonstrates that you know these things have purpose outside of just you know a one-time art show so right 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 and then that's the best part of i feel like most of what you've done is you've taken the opportunity to put that content on places like soundcloud youtube that can be reused by other people right when i search i would say when i search streamix on instagram and tiktok i mean of course your account and your content pops up. But more than that, it's other people's dance or music content using your mixes yeah. that show up, which I think is incredible there. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Yeah. I think there's a little bit of conflict when it comes to like what the new TikTok format is with everything's like super short sure. and like yeah. consumable in byte form. But I do recognize that, um, what do all the comments say when you look at like TikTok music? It's always like, yo, put it on Spotify, put it on SoundCloud, make yeah. a longer version. So it's almost like, yeah. Okay, I think we always knew the answer is like always make a longer version so that people can of course continue to consume your content like after they close the app, right? And I think as long as we continue to do that, then like longevity is kind of the, the key in this this field. So. Yeah, 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 absolutely. I mean, TikTok and Instagram are definitely the discovery platforms, right? You put in yep. co short consumable content that then leads people who are interested into long form content at a later mm -hmm. point in time. Okay, sweet. So let's take now. A step back. So we were talking about Electric Daisy Ray, which occurred, if I'm not mistaken, at the start of October, right? Yep. So rewinding a few months back <clears throat> to July and would love to talk about the Tummel meetup, the Tummel, and broadly, before we even started with that, like just Tummel in general. And the first question I wanted to ask is, what does being Tummel mean to you so that we all mm -hmm. know and we all share that identity? such an interesting question because I feel like it's it's so integral to like how I grew up like it's hard to say it's not like I really put on a hat to be like today I am right. <laughs> it's like that's true right it's interesting I, I definitely think there, there's a lot of very fascinating questions I've had with people who are Tamil from Indi India and then Tamil from Sri Lanka mm -hmm. what mm -hmm. differences in identity come through and I think it's like not to get like way too dark on the matter but like the fact that a lot of the like Tamil Yulam people who are in Toronto, which is like 99% of my family, I'm like one of the only few Americans who are here within yeah. my family, <clears throat> had to escape a genocide to be here. And the level of mm -hmm. pride that comes behind being Tamil is different. And mm -hmm. it's hard mm -hmm. to, it, it's imbued into like, so many different conversations we have with our parents, as well as like whenever we see the news, it's okay. We are here originally to maintain our safety and our maintain our core community and from that right. i think also derives a lot of very strong artist movements which is why i think mm -hmm. the toronto scene has a lot of independent Tamil artists that are coming up and like the type of topics they sing about and talk about and rap about 
it's unfortunate I didn't have a chance to actually participate too much in Toronto because I wish I had more uh, connectivity to that. Sure. But yeah, I, I think what it kind of reinforces in me is that whereas some people, say, oh yeah, I grew up Tamil, therefore I like it. Not to downplay that at all, but I think like whenever I work on something now, it's like, okay. I, I really can see how other people who have grown up in similar situations, not even in the same city as me, not even related to me, but they have that same drive. And I think it's like, okay. There's something core connecting us and it, mm. and, and it, it comes out in the form of art and that it's okay. It's almost like a brainwave. It's like, all right, we know that we're pushing the same kind of flag forward, so to say. So it's cool. Yeah. Right. Right. Okay. That makes sense. And to that point, my next question was going to be, what does your Tamil community look like? But you shared that you have a lot of family <laughs> in Toronto, but yeah. now here, what does your Tamil community or rather just community look like in general? Yeah, I'd say a lot of it has been pretty scattered. So when I was in mm -hmm. San Diego, there's always like a Tamil Tungam, like somewhere around every, in each city. And then Wyoming was zero. It was just me. And like okay. maybe like a few grad students here and there from Chennai and then, or Monterey right. or whatever. Right. And then when I went to the East coast, I was suddenly like, oh, sweet. Like a lot of us are here, but actually even right. then outside of New York, the majority of them are from India. And so it's only yeah. once I started hanging out a little bit more in New York and Queens and Long Island, I was like, oh, like here is like, we're all the like Sri Lankan origin people are, I was like, oh, okay, mm -hmm. nice. Like I knew we were somewhere, yeah. but like, it's, it's kind of like nice and reinforcing to be like, no, you know, now I'm noticing also a lot of the families have kind of moved in risen to the Midwest. So it's kind of everywhere at this point. But I think what I really like about the dance world as well as the music world is that a lot of very strong friendships are formed virtually just because we have common interests. And um, so we continue to make, maintain contact. We find events to like all travel together too. And it's good. So nice. That's sweet. That's sweet. And so now coming to the Tamil meetup that we had the opportunity to meet at and you DJed, which was really <laughs> awesome because I think that was the one biggest Tamil meetup of the year with the crazy line out the door. There was a whole like bar, like they forced us to like kick everyone out or actually they didn't even force us. They didn't even tell us. They just <clears throat> kicked everyone out. I, I have and, never seen. Yeah, that was, right. that was definitely a one of a kind night for sure. I would say it was yeah. interesting kind of like comparing my expectations versus what actually occurred. And I would okay. say just like taking a step forward is like one of my, one of the positive things that came out of it is that Siva, who was playing drums, yeah. Uh, that's a very old friend of mine. He was on Wanted Oshiks, the, the very team who came up to me when I was 19 being like, yo, your music is great. And I was like, okay, great. Like, right. it's cool to kind of see things come full circle. Of and course. so I brought him with me towards, uh, to work in Electric Daisy Rave and he was able to right. play drums right. on my set. But, you know, like the first time some people went to Thumbo Meetup, they were like, yeah, it was, it was cool. It was just like, it's kind of like a happy hour. Some people were singing, some people were kind of dancing. It was like pretty chill. So I, I, I thought I was like, I'm just going to show up and I'll be like, I guess I'll just play some Tamil songs here and there and just kind of vibe yeah. and talk to people. No, it was like absolute, just like tsunami of people like singing Tamil music yeah. to the point where the DJs, like me, Bain and Margaret had to kind of like ad hoc shift strategy. We were like, okay, I think the original plan was to split like in thirds and yeah. just kind of, you know, play whatever for like a few hours and then we were like right. dude like these people are like every time i play a song and i go like one year older like they just knew the song yeah. more and more and i was like okay so like let's just see how far back we can go and at this point <laughs> the only person who had like music at even like that stage like 2003 and like 1997 like humble music was like my laptop they were like guys just use my laptop right. let's just just, just just cycle through old stuff you don't even have to mix it it's fine yeah. and so you just have people yeah. just singing like every classic songs i have not heard saying in like 15, 20 years. And I was like, dude, this is right. amazing. I was like, I and definitely not color. saying at a nightclub in New York city for sure. No, not even in Queens. This is like the middle of Manhattan. I was like, this is incredible. Right. So it's cool. It was like a really nice, like reinforcing uh, like community reinforcing moment. Of course it was also like really rowdy and hectic, but like, you know, that's just part of the game. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. So, I mean, yeah. I don't think any fights broke out, which is the key part. There was no, like nothing crazy, crazy, but it was like chaos. In many cases. Yeah. The, there was like that 15 moments. minute period. Yeah, go ahead. Oh, yeah, yeah. No, there's a 15 minute period where I think like everyone was so invested in just singing Tamil songs. Yeah. That like the owners were just like, I, I'm i literally just not making money anymore. Like you guys are just here to like effectively karaoke Tamil music. And I was like, right. that's not bad. 
I think one of my favorite moments is Rom, I mean, it was by a DJ named Margaret Wright, played the car driving scene from Gilly Arjunarivillu, and then everyone was like singing it. And I was like, you must be kidding me. I was like, of all songs, like people are singing this. I was like, all right, this is this is a whole different party now. <laughs> so I was like, this is cool. So, yeah. And, and the best part is we remember, like when yeah. that song plays and in that yeah. moment, I feel like everyone was just like the same thing. The Tato yeah. Sumo's driving down the streets of Madurai, I think it was, right? And it's just like everyone yeah. inside, including all the actors, right? We're all wearing white, white on white, right? And it's like, yeah. damn, like we missed, we should have done that, right? Like worn vesties and gone the full on. <laughs> that would have been next level. Yeah, yeah. yeah absolutely. Yeah. That's awesome. That's awesome. So looking at that, right? You also posted a story after that one with your, yeah. I'm, I'm looking at it right now. I haven't pulled up here, but it's the a uh, Tamil Meetups NYC thoughts. So the first one you said was meet more Elam Tamil brothers and sisters in one location, right? So you did say the New York piece. So this became like an environment for you to meet them. Have you been able mm-hmm. to stay in touch with them, make friends? What does that look like for you? Yeah, I've seen those with a couple of them, um, for sure. I, I think what was kind of cool is, you know, I usually don't ask questions like, you know, like what part of like Tamil Nadu, what part of Sri Lanka are your mm-hmm. parents from? But I, I just found myself like throughout the night just asking that question repeatedly. And I almost found that like, honestly, a ton of them are from like nearby where my parents grew up. And I was like, this is amazing. They're like, right. oh, you're from, you know, like you have family in Jaffna, like I have family in Kirinochi and I have family in like Trinko. Yeah. And I was like, dude, this is sick. I was like, where have you guys been my whole life? <laughs> it's like, all right. It just seems like, you know, like there's a lot of like regional history behind why like certain communities settled in certain places. Right. And like, for example, like a lot of the um, Sri Lankan Sinhala people are in Detroit. Um, and I don't mm-hmm. remember exactly why that's the case. But then on the contrary, like a lot of the Indian Tamils are in like the Bay Area and Jersey. And then it right. so it turns out that a lot of, you know, so these things kind of split up and it's all just inertia. But it's cool yeah. that like once I found it, I was like, oh, it's like kind of like homecoming. I was like, all right. So now I know if I ever want to throw a Tamil party in New York, like it will yeah. it will hit every time. So that's It'll hit. Right. Yeah. yeah. I mean, I think that's the best part, right, is hopefully there's more and more people who are like, let's create new social, cultural experiences in New York City. Yeah. Because there is, one, the demand for it, and two, people will embrace it. Tamils and non-Tamils, right, alike. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. I see. I mean, I can maybe give a question back to you like you have probably better yeah. intel on how many non tamil people do you think are have come to the meetup so i think you've told me it's a pretty decent number right yeah i would honestly go as far to say 50 percent of the turnout at events is usually non tamil dude that's awesome because right? it means it's just like very direct exposure from like djs playing tamil music to other communities and this is exactly coming you know like how do we know what certain punjabi and hindi songs are it's like it's right. the same thing it's just now it's just a nice like like role reversal so it's cool yeah yeah yeah, yeah. and that's the piece where it's like super interesting because i would say of those 50 percent, 25 percent are just other south indian languages that aren't tamil the where the sure. people are coming in and as as we do at most of the meetups we'll play a Telugu song or some Malayalam songs, right? And so bringing in that culture, I think like Malayalam in this case has an affinity towards Tamil music in some yeah. cases. The, in many cases, the language is very similar and the music mm-hmm. is shared between both cultures, right? But also on the Telugu side, right? It's we enjoy going as Tamil, we enjoy going to Telugu parties and we love the music and they enjoy coming to Tamil parties, which is just always great. And of course, Kandiga too, right? The, yeah. the music is very similar across all of them, which is great. Yeah. yeah. And, you know, there's like certain altars that are just like pillars across the entire, like Air Rahman, like, uh, yeah. I think there's some Malayali people who know Air Rahman music better than like some of the Tamil friends, honestly. It's like, you know, so it's cool. Yeah. Um, you know, like you play a song, yeah. they're like, oh yeah, of course I need this. So talking about like Tamil music specifically and going back to a bit about what you were saying with your mixes, I'm curious, you always started using Tamil mixes, right? Or incorporating Tamil music as a spin. What of those mixes do you think really made you go viral? Or what was like the most popular one in your opinion? Is there a reason that was? Yeah, that's an interesting question. So maybe if I take a couple steps back, I think there's some people who 
actually think I don't mix enough Tamil music. And I think I actually agree with that. And I think it's because I have so much like nostalgia connection with some of these songs that I don't want to mm -hmm. like ruin it, so to speak. Right. Fair. And so Fair. I've kind of come to be very selective about how I go about these things and making sure it's like done mm -hmm. in a way that doesn't like just completely, you know, throwing an EDM beat on top of like a classic song and, just, you know, it doesn't, right. it's because I think like when I was growing up, I've seen so many CDs and stuff that did exactly that. And I was like, I would just rather yeah. listen to the original. Right. And right. you don't, and the, that kind of signifies some level of a failure as a music producer. Like if you inspire people to intentionally close your track and listen to the original, it's like, okay, you probably didn't do a good job. So yeah, yeah, fair. Um, I think I would say there's a few tracks that I think I personally very interest, like I have a very personal close to my heart. Mm -hmm. And I think it surprises people too, because a lot of them were like, oh, like, how about like, lean on Rangila that has like 3 million views and how about like this and that because it has like Chama Chama has like a million and like this has like this went viral because okay. of like this and but the thing is like sometimes it's the tracks that are like I like but a yeah. lot of people like a lot more than me and so right. taking all that into consideration it's like if I decide to mix a Tumble song I must like it a lot like that mm. remix a lot if I even went as far as like publishing it so a few of right. them that I think like catch my eye like my eye every time I see it on my page is like yeah. there's one I did with Pache Kiligal and a Jay Sean okay. and Sean Paul song. And then there's this mixtape nice. I made for a classical competition called Hansini, where okay. I was just like, I'm going to make this whole mixtape effectively all South Indian, but like all melody nice. songs, not Kutu, because it was a classical competition. Oh, sweet. <clears throat> and then there is a few other, there's one I've done for another classical competition, bringing in like Innisei from Godfather or whatever, or whatever they call that movie. And some of these things have like delayed effects because I think within the dance circuit, people see, probably still see like Kutu is like a, it's like a tool where like you use it yeah. in certain um, circumstances within your piece. And then mm -hmm. the melody songs don't really get used as much. They still opt for some Arjit song or something. So it's not sure. the dance circuit. It's like India, it's like Malaysia actually. And there's a mm -hmm. bit of a delayed onset where, so Pache mm -hmm. after I made that mix with the original Yesutas vocal, my friend Aditya Rao, who now also sings professionally for various movies, he came in and was like, okay. let me just do a cover of it. This is like 2017. And then like... Of your, like a cover onto your mix. Oh, wow. Yeah. Okay. And then he like filmed it in Uti or something and put it on YouTube. Okay. Nothing happens for four years. And then in COVID, someone in Kerala found it and then it became like everyone's TikTok and real. And then wow. it blew up from like whatever it was to like multiple million four years later. And that's incredible. None of it was spurred by the dance circuit. None of it was America. And we were like, okay, I right. guess like this is what, you know, finally caught on some traction. Um, so I don't know. It, it's really hard to say. I said the, the other one uh, was the one with Kangali Rindal with um, Arjun Adapali. Mm -hmm. It was uh, mm -hmm. um, using Raginder's violin instrumental on top of it. That one also caught okay. a lot of traction. But if you look at the comments, all of it's from India. So it's actually, it's like mm -hmm. an interesting kind of dichotomy where it's like, those are the tracks that went viral, so to speak. Um, right. But it wasn't America um, who pushed it. I would say the American ones are more the Hindi and the Punjabi ones still. Um, so maybe one day we'll see that switch. But right now, it's still not quite the case. So It's not. Okay. Okay. That's super, super interesting you mentioned that. Because that's an interesting take when I even see the content that we publish on TikTok and Instagram of the parties right and mm -hmm. it's like hey here's the here's a song playing and we, usually the reels are like it's like pan into the dj pan out to the crowd everyone's vibing the drop hits people are going crazy right mm -hmm. and it's interesting because it's like of course we do in new york we have a, like a big community that's all pretty involved right but a lot of the comments and a lot of the views and stuff come internationally there yep. right which yep. shows how global the Tamil community is but also shows how hard it is to tap into those communities yeah. you know, right I'll, I'll notice one other thing is that I will strongly applaud the Punjabi community for really standing mm. behind their artists and being very communally driven in that if there is some new Punjabi song that comes out everyone hears about its presence super quickly Everyone shares mm. it amongst their friends and they post it and they make stories about it and whatever um, in a way that I think the Tamil community 
doesn't quite do it yet. So like, for example, like mm. even like some of the independent artists, like yeah. I personally love sharing it with all my friends, but I think it's not the same. It's like when like a new Punjabi independent singer puts up a track, like that Punjabi mm -hmm. track goes viral faster than anybody else, but it is the Punjabi right. community who does it themselves. And I think that's actually like to be applauded and kind of emulated. Yeah, that makes sense. That's super interesting because I feel like, do you feel like that inflection is happening now with I think the, mm -hmm. yeah, I think you know where I'm going with this, but yeah, what do you yeah. think? Yeah, I think the inflection is like, we're rounding that corner slowly now. And I think it's a lot of people feel disconnected from Bollywood, Hollywood and that, all that kind of stuff because mm -hmm. it, it's just, it's different, right? Whereas now if you see like someone coming from your own community making it, they're like, oh, that's, this is like one of us. Like we, we will yeah. always kind of a, show up and afford uh, support and that kind of thing. So, right. And they're also getting, uh, many of these Tamil artists are getting media attention, which mm -hmm. is also putting them on the map, right? And yeah. giving them the opportunity to say, hey, this is me. This is my story. It reminds me a lot of like, it's like the like the punk rock movement where like everyone's like oh no this is like this is my band this is my singer and then they go viral they were like i was here first before anybody else you know it's like that kind of feeling as opposed right. to if like a new vijay song comes out it's like of course it's vijay like whatever like yeah, it's yeah, gonna yeah. hit a million right <laughs> it's like, yeah, so. yeah yeah of course every everyone's gonna listen to the songs but i think that's also interesting because i would say the only way to become popular as a musician in the Tamil industry or just like community is if you created music at a, on a movie, right? That got played on a movie, your part, like a playback singer or like a producer, whatever it may be. But now it's like the independent scene is getting yeah. the intention that it deserves. Yeah. And we're seeing a feedback cycle also where like a lot of the larger labels are also kind of pulling in people from the independent mm -hmm. scene as well as making their own independent right. labels like like Era Manma is one to now, right. Santosh Narayan is pushing like a huge independent movement. And I mm -hmm. think mm -hmm. they're recognizing that, you know, like film is not the only way. And in fact, like India has got to be the only country where I can think of where like film is, it's like film or nothing. Right. Yeah. And like every other yeah. country, like you can make music outside of that. Right. So yeah, it's yeah. finally broadening yeah. a little bit, which is good. Right. 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 So that was actually going to be, I mean, we're talking about it already. That was going to be the next question I was going to ask you is, from your point of view, being in the music space, especially in America for now, what is it like 10 years, 15 years broadly, how, in your opinion, has won the music scene, but in general, specifically the Tamil music scene evolved since you started? Yeah, that's, that's a really good question. I think it's a lot of the trends that you have pointed out already. It's like, in some senses, like independent Tamil music tends to be ahead of the curve in certain genres. Mm -hmm. I think it also pulls you know, a lot of like the Afrobeat dance hall stuff that we see in Toronto. But yeah. there's always a wall. And I think that's like when it comes to broad adoption. And I think that has to do with like a lot of gatekeeping from people who are very powerful in various locations. And I yeah. think finally with like the internet and social media, like there's a lot of democratization that's happening and you can mm -hmm. I, I mean i'm just gonna like directly point out like that amama song that like sai seva made is like yeah. i think like sheer skill like that's just like everyone yeah. is so talented like the dancers are talented yeah. the singers are talented the music producer is talented the right. engineers like everything you listen to it you're like this could beat like certain things that are in certain movies and right. i think people recognize quality when they see it and then that inspires people to kind of like start to really share. And I think that's what it's going to be because I, I don't think like there was ever a lack of talent in the independent mm -hmm. scene. Mm -hmm. It's in fact, like you could even just, I mean, just go to like the local Carnatic concert and then like listen to some film songs and you're like, this singer is better, but it's okay because yeah. this is just how yeah. it is in different industries and that's how it goes. But now I think people are starting to like cross share and fuse in a way that is like culturally sensitive. And I think that's actually starting to like, you know, like naturally pull people in audience wise. So, yeah. Yeah, that's fair. I think the key point to what you said, right, especially about the Amama song, is that the high quality and the high standard that that song sets, and it's not just that song, I think a lot of the new independent Tamil artists, especially the ones that are now fully embraced the Instagram, TikTok age, where it's like, create awesome, high quality content. It, it's so true. It makes it 
so that it puts Tamil music, right, and the music that's created at a higher level than yeah. was previously perceived, right? Because when I what I like when I think about it is when I go and reflect on my experience listening to Tamil music in even environments like college. So this was like for me, this was 2015, right? Mm-hmm. When it, we had, I went to, again, as I mentioned before, a small private school. We had a pretty small South Asian community. And within that, a smaller South Asian organization. And it wasn't until my junior and senior year that we even had, like, of the spring and fall show that usually these South Asian groups do, we had, like, one set, like, one part of it where we did Tamil and Telugu music. And even then, it was, like, very small. It was, like, a five-minute. It was songs mixed together, right? Mm -hmm. And the reflection always was, like, oh, yeah, these are just, like, songs, like, people break out in dances in the movies, and it's just, like, people are just doing crazy dance moves, right? That was, like, the reflection from the non-Tamil people, or now, rather, non-South Indian people, right? And I, I, I don't fault that, as I say this, right? Because it's, that's essentially, like, at least a perception from many of them who are being international Indian students coming mm-hmm. into America. That's a perception in India, right? But now with the independent artists creating that higher standard, creating like super high quality music videos, right? That it's like at the levels of like the hip hop stars of the world, I think that sets a new stage for yeah, them to 100%. like now set the standards to high and people are willing to take that in there. Yeah, I actually think so they've already called out the Punjabi example. I think another example is actually right. the Latin community is in a really good job of this. Mm. Like, if you listen to like some of the mm. older like reggaeton songs and salsa, like of course it's like not super high quality like music and like sound engineering, but it, it doesn't right. matter. It's, it's like traditional like folk elements that come in. So there, that was never a of question. Um, but now when it comes to like broad adoption, like let's say like Despacito and like these other songs that like mm-hmm. one call my, like, mm-hmm. now you have like you know like Diplo era like music production coming in where like right. everything sounds as if, if you just took the lyrics out, like it would hit at a club anyways. And I think yeah. now I, like all the other languages are kind of catching up to that idea where it's like, okay, like no matter what the beat has to hit and be at the same level as yeah. anything else to be taken seriously. And then it, at some point, maybe the language doesn't matter anymore because we've become so like kind of cosmopolitan and like accepting of different languages now that right. people just enjoy it. So. Yeah. Because before people used to be like, oh yeah, like these older like nineties and thousand songs, you have to remix it to put like another beat on top of it for it to be like mm-hmm. enjoyable. Now it's like you don't mm-hmm. need that. Everything just already at a high standard and it like now yeah. sets the bar. It's like now the next person who attempts a good the song like Amama is like you have to at least match that, right? So it's all right. All right. It's daunting, but in a great way. So Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, hopefully it just continues to move yeah. industry forward and people to that point, people will be more excited about entering because they want to be associated or be part of these high quality productions here in the later time. Nice. Okay. Sweet. What I wanted to get into now was more around what your advice to creators and how you balance being a creative, but also being effectively a healthcare professional, right? Because I think that's as we're talking about like the new standard for Tamil creators with songs like Amama, I think about, okay, what is it going to take for more people to be willing to pursue their creative talents, right? Because yeah. in many cases, most of us started like Carnotic singing, playing some instrument, but then we do that just to get into colleges, right? For college apps. And then at some point our parents are like, okay, now you have to stop all that and just go professional. Right. And I think that's the most of the mentality that at least I've seen amongst my friends. And I'm trying to think about what it takes for them to pursue a career in creative, like being a creator outside of also being a professional. And to that point, I don't know if people know this, but you're a healthcare professional. So can you start by telling us about that and what that journey has been like and what the balance has been between your creative side and your professional side? So what I work on right now is I'm kind of on the business and venture side of biotech, specifically Mm -hmm. um, medical devices that are for neurological and psychiatric diseases. But right now I work for a company in Boston, remotely from San Diego. And the entire point is to take just the same way that the AI boom is capturing language data and image data. We're taking tons and tons of brain data and seeing if we can find 
you know, really early diagnosis to things years mm -hmm. ahead of time, or we can just find higher precision of things that are happening in real time. So, mm -hmm. you know, how do you know if you're depressed? Maybe you can just like look at your sleep schedule and maybe you'll find the answer a lot faster than you would like if you were trying to track your mood across a month, right? Things like that. So yeah. Yeah. the problem is, you know, it would be nice to say, I work like a nine to five and then from five to midnight, I do music stuff. But the thing is, this is a startup, so I don't work nine to five. I work okay. nine until whatever, yeah. whatever, right? So Until you I fall think, asleep at your desk. Yeah, and then wake up and keep yeah. going, right? So yeah. I think there's an, there's an important element of carving out time for yourself. And I think I've like really grown in the last year to understand like my limits when it comes to content creation. And it sucks mm -hmm. because I think right now it's, it's all about volume over quality and, and longevity mm -hmm. and like really mm -hmm. building out your projects. And I think that's a little bit annoying, but it's just like, sometimes you can't really try to change the direction of the wind. It's got to like go with it and take what you can from it and then keep going. But there's a lot of doctors out there who used to sing, who used to dance and they're like, dude, I can't just keep posting on reels and like, I don't have time. Right. Yeah. And it's like, yeah. I don't have time if it's for the women, they're like, I don't have time to put on makeup and to like do my hair and like do all this stuff and just to be camera ready, just to make like a one minute video. It's like, I don't have time for this. Like I have right. life to save, right? And yeah. it's like, thankfully, I think COVID has kind of changed that perception a bit where I see a lot of people just dancing in scrubs and stuff and that's cool. Yeah. But the point here is like, if you want to be serious about the art, you have to find a way to like, work within your means to have longevity. And I think that's like just a key word that's been like driving through my head where it's like, I have seen a lot of artists in the last three years who had, it's like, like fireworks success where it's like rocket to the top, explode, and then there's nothing afterwards. And these are people who went from like very minimal followers to like 250K, like huge, huge followings. And then found mm -hmm. that it's difficult to sustain because honestly, I think unless you're a full-time content creator, and I think even they struggle with this, it's like, how do you continue to make things at a high quality that you're proud of and want to be associated with and maintain keeping your fans happy who are extremely fickle and like, you know, have no idea what really they want. In many cases, they're, it's not, it's, it's not in anybody's control. It's algorithm driven, no. right? Algorithm it's driven. And Instagram. It's, it's basically setting you up for unreasonable expectations. And I think that's right. very frustrating. So. I would say the number one thing is whether you're in the healthcare field, whether you're, you know, working in nine to five, it doesn't really matter. I think the point is, it's like, at the end of the day, what kind of products are you happy with? Like, I'm personally happy with songs that are three to five minutes long. Mm -hmm. And I think I personally feel like some of the coolest like transitions and like kind of like interweaving of different songs happens across the evolution of like multiple minutes. And so within 15 seconds, like you miss it. It's it's a little bit frustrating sometimes where I'll be like, Hey, go check out the full version on SoundCloud. But then the 15 second version will actually seem more boring comparatively because mm -hmm. you know, it's, this is like my style of mixing, right? Okay. So <clears throat> ultimately I think my, I, I always stand by this idea that like you have a core fan base and that fan base will always inform other fan bases and it slowly accrues over time. And we have this interesting time blindness because we see people going from moderate to very viral and it makes you feel like you're too slow or but then mm. it's like is their core fan base really that or are they fast consuming many people who are all in that category and they're just as quickly willing to leave them and not really support them right like is it monetizable right. like if you said hey like i'm throwing a concert but i need to like fundraise 10k to be able to like bring together all these things like would they throw in money or would none of them throw in money right and those are kind of the type of people who you need to be like really chasing and um, like core supporters. And I think that is hard to find. And you're going to often feel yourself going against the grain, both from a work perspective, because you're going to be like, I had to like strip my, stress myself thin with my free time just to put up reels and content and pictures just to seem like I'm keeping up to speed with the, everyone else. And right. at the same time, trying to like really chase the thing that you care about, where in like 15 years, you look back at it and be like, I'm proud of myself for doing that, right? Whereas I think there's a lot of people who'd be like, I don't really care that I did that real. And you'll look back 10 years ago and just like scroll right past it. Right. I think that's, that's yeah. hard. It's a lot of soul searching and there's so much yeah. noise. It's just like nonstop noise and you have to kind of filter through it, you know, keep your head down, I guess. Right. Right. So I'm curious if you 
were starting off on your mm-hmm. creative career right now, right? And you didn't know all this wealth of experience and all this time that you've been a part of this, how would you go about it? What advice do you have either for people who want to mix, DJ, yeah. dancers? Yeah. How would you go about that? Okay, so I'm going to say something that's probably controversial, but you should be you should be ready to fail as much as possible. And I think what the problem with social media and a lot of these communities is, is that you put up a mix, whether it's a three out of 10 or it's a nine out of 10, the answer is the same. It's like, yo, fire, bro, like killed it. I would love to put it on Spotify, like whatever, right? And I think that caps you, like that imposes a huge hard ceiling on top of you that um, you're never going to think critically about your work enough for you to be like, hold on, like I should continue to improve the quality or the structure Mm -hmm. or the concept or build out the whole thing because some people just put up 10 second concepts and then it's like okay make this five minutes the original song's five minutes your mix could also be five minutes right and mm-hmm. i think without that the criticism culture where it comes from a good place of course there are some there's always trolls online who are just trying to like fling me into the ground but right. finding a close community of mentors and other peers to be like hey like this is good improve it in this way and you'll get even better traction right and i think a lot of that is gone i think everything is extremely positively tilted and I think it's one of the reasons why, unfortunately, I would say that like a lot of the music producers and DJs that come out of like the last five, 10 years have not been able to hit their full potential because they're getting the, like the attaboy like too early. Um, right. And I think it makes me sound like I'm old and like back in my day, like whatever, but it's, it's honestly true. It's like, if they want to be a future mentor to somebody else, you also have to continue to be elevating yourself to the point where you feel like you have the like the acumen to be able to mentor right i think this yeah. is that's the main biggest thing is like be open to strict criticism and don't take it personally and if you take it personally ask someone else right and just keep asking around yeah. and then eventually you'll find the consensus of people who are like okay this is what i should focus on like great job two songs sound really good but maybe focus on the auto quality you know whatever it is so right that's fair and that goes to the point of like Okay, when you put something out, it's you can't decide to sustain that or same quality, same vibe for the next, let's say, five years. You have to continue figuring out ways mm-hmm. to create that new hype, create that new, I would say, unique voice, right? That attracts people in. Yeah. Makes sense. Yeah. Makes sense. Mm-hmm. So on that part, what do you what would you say when you look at either the current generation of specifically musicians, some musicians or the next generation crop that's coming in, what do you feel like potentially is missing or what would you want in that, in them? What do you want to see in them? You know, I honestly, I think it's a lot of the same stuff that I've been thinking about for a while, which is just persistence and, Mm-hmm. it's going to sound almost antithetical to what I just said, but like, don't be afraid. Right. What I'm excited to see by the recent generation is that how many more people are putting up their content. A lot of people are diversifying. <clears throat> it's not just remixes. It's not just dance. People are thinking of all sorts of different new creative things that I hadn't thought of before. You have like Kanata covers on top of hip hop songs. You have like AI things, which honestly like AI is controversial, but it's still, it's, yeah. it's an art. It's hard to you know really make it sound convincing there's a lot of cool things that are coming out of it and if you have an idea like you know show someone at least right there's so mm-hmm. many people who reached out to me being like yo man i've made like 15 to 20 mixes but like i've, I've just never uploaded it i just like i want to know if like you think it's cool i was like you, you don't have to get my approval man just like <laughs> put it up, right? it's fine like, <laughs> yeah like don't be afraid like don't have like you know regret later that you never had a chance to like, you know, socialize all this content. Show the world. That's the number one thing. Yeah, exactly. It's like, and I'm going to say it now, especially since I'm like getting old now where I'm finding it difficult for me to find time for myself. Like if you have time right now and you have the momentum and you have the community around you, like nothing should be holding you back from uploading stuff. Not even the fear Mm -hmm. of criticism because that's only going to help you improve. Just continue to put it up there because you never know when that day comes where you may not have time anymore. And, like you should always take advantage of it now. Yeah. Well, to that point, criticism is actually great. Like similar to what you had said for the previous question, right? But even now it's the fact that somebody cared enough yep. to listen to what you had to say and then take the time to comment 
means that you are doing something right. They just want to see it done better in one way, yeah. shape, or the other, right? Which yeah. is, again, it's a really good place to be because the worst place is for people to see something and be like not care enough to say something. Yeah. yeah. The other thing I'm really going to push for sure is collaboration. Like I'm a huge mm -hmm. fan of this idea of it's like rising tide lifts all ships, right? Especially with a Tamil community, like we have to, we're just now rounding the corner for us to all kind of get more visibility within the world. And I think, you know, like if you have an opportunity to collaborate with another Tamil artist, like do it. If you have a chance to take your track and like find dancers to dance on top of it and like make like a trend, doesn't be a trend. Just make, you know, make more content that amplifies whatever you do. 100% take advantage of that, <clears throat> of that opportunity. Like it, it's not a solo journey, um, yeah. right? We're all kind of pushing towards the same target. So, right, right. Nice. That's sweet. Okay. I appreciate you spending all this time with us. Yeah, I have a few last questions. Uh, to talk through. Well, first one is more of a fun one, but I asked a few friends, hey, what should I ask Dr. Streamix? And this is one of the questions that they gave to me is where does the name Dr. Streamix come from? Like we get the mm -hmm. mix and we know your name is Sri Hari, but yep. where, what is the origin of the name? Yeah, so the idea is that Streamix rhymes with remix. And then on okay. top of that, I was originally DJ Streamix up until 2012. And then I got into grad school and my roommate was like, oh, you're, you're getting a doctorate. You should go by Dr. Streamix. And I was like, that's dumb. And then the next day I was like, you know what? Let's do it. Whatever. <laughs> so then <I> just stuck. <laughs> Since then, it was always a joke where it was because I was in grad school. They were like, okay, if you drop out, you have to get rid of the doctorate in your name. I was like, yeah, let's yeah. not do that. And then the other one does, if you graduate, you had to put another doctor in front of your name. So you're Dr. Streamix. And then there's some mm -hmm. people who joke around just calling me Dr. Doctor. So Dr. Doctor, right? Yeah. So but yeah, actual actual cool. doctor, right? Yeah, <laughs> that's exactly. awesome. Yeah. Sweet. So sweet, sweet, yeah, sweet. That's, that's basically it. I don't know. Okay. Sometimes okay. the silly ideas are the ones that stick. So Right, right. As long I mean it's catchy, right? Like it hits, it's a vibe. And I think to that point, Dr. Streamix, I I never realized like it would be because of remixing, but mm -hmm. makes sense. Nice. Nice. And last question is, what is next for you for Dr. Streamix? What do you what do you want to do? And what's like the bigger dream here with your creative life? Yeah, that's a good question. So I think a couple of things. One is certain things I've always wanted to do that I've never had the bandwidth for. So like I would love to make a, a Kutta song from scratch. I would love to make a Bangra song from scratch. I'd love to make an R&B song from scratch. It's just like, I have all these artists that I can work with. I've just not had the time for me to sit down and do it. The thing is, the last like major album effort I made was many, many years ago, where it was like a huge visual effort with one of my friends, Mithin Thomas, where we went around and like, filmed all these things. And that was awesome. But I think I don't, there's no way I have the bandwidth for that anymore. And I also think okay. that like in order to have ownership, because there's just so much copyright hacking down of people's accounts, it needs to really revolve around original content for me now, especially mm -hmm. now that I'm trying to break a little bit more into like other scenes, like um, film, TV, mm -hmm. really need the original content portfolio. And mm -hmm. I'm also noticing that there's a lot of increased attention, such as like what Moralto Films is doing and also Hasan Minaj for like the chronicle or like the history of the dance circuit. And it's like stuff that I'd love mm -hmm. to be involved in. But again, that would also involve me kind of pulling back on other stuff and diving more into bigger and heavier hitting things. But we'll see, right. you know, I'm okay. keeping it open right now. So we'll see. Nice. As long as I'm doing something, nice. I think that's important. Yeah. 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 So hopefully one day we'll see a new album, original, all original music directly from Dr. Shreemix. So hopefully man. that'd be cool. We'll see. Yeah. We'll be the that's first awesome. Know. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. Well, awesome. Again. Thank you so much for joining us today. And we will hopefully, I mean, I, I'm sure there's a lot more we didn't talk about today that warrants, hopefully, if you're down for it, a second episode um, at some point yeah. in the future. Let's do, a, yeah. let's do a second episode. We can pull in a couple of people and do a panel. Yeah. And just bounce around yeah, some ideas. Absolutely. So. Yeah, that'd be cool. That'd be cool. We'll, we'll, we'll run something like that. But awesome. Well, thank you for joining us. Before we leave, any final parting words for the RMM community? 
no, continue to grow. I mean, I, I'm seeing all the awesome things that are happening. I've seen events increase, workshops increase, people meeting each other that had no idea they were in the same city. No, keep that up. Yeah. Like I'm, there's nothing for me to do. I'm just going to sit back and watch it. This is awesome. So, and hopefully come out and continue to throw bangers on at the parties. Yeah. Yep. I'll show up for sure. Awesome. Don't worry. Absolutely. Okay, cool. Thanks y'all. Thanks everyone for tuning in. And with that, we'll see you next time. Cheers.